1985, a truck driver in Hiroshima, Japan, drank what he thought was a free beverage from a vending machine. He was quickly hospitalized and passed away two days later, leading to the discovery that the drink had been poisoned. Over the next seven months, many others would fall victim to similar circumstances, leaving behind a case that may forever remain unsolved. Today, we discuss the strange case of the vending machine murders. This is Red Web. Welcome back, Task Force, to another episode of Red Web, the show all about the unsolved, the creepy, the unknown, here in this corporeal realm. I'm your resident mystery enthusiast, Trevor Collins, and joining me, hearing this mystery for the very first time, with that gut instinct and everything in between, Alfredo Diaz. This is terrifying. Mm-hmm. Because, like, I mean, we do a lot of, re- like, different mysteries. Yeah. Some murders, some internet mysteries, some... Um, you know, not so nefarious or whatnot. Melting beasts. Some, yeah, some cryptids. <laughs> but this, this could happen to you at any moment. This, you right. could literally be listening to this podcast right now, and this could happen. Hold to on, you. don't, oh, don't be putting that out there. I'm not. I, look, I'm just gonna get us involved in some sort of hot case. Look, I got alibis. <laughs> oh, right, <laughs> it's here. It's this show. Um, but it's just terrifying, right? Mm-hmm. And like when you're. Reading and describing the hook, I, I sat here thinking, like, what stopped someone from, like, I don't know, the chip bag line to just put, put oh, a little needle and no. put some stuff in? Yeah, I just, th- these, right, are the, these are the kind of things you can just ra- run into randomly. They, they most likely won't get caught because mm-hmm. it's just so subtle yet so effective in doing something bad to another human being. Right. It, it's, it's terrible, man. I know. It's, the world's a scary place. This is one of those things that hits real close to home. You're right. I feel like if AI, because that's a big topic right now, if AI were to become sentient and angry and want to replace, you know, T-1000s and all that Terminator style, I feel like a big splashy war ain't the way. I feel like with all the machinery and mechanized factories we got out there, they would just, you know, tweak our foods to be toxic or something, you know, and then suddenly all of us one day wake up dead. Yeah. Turn up missing. I, like... As you're describing that, I'm like, where would be like the turning point? I think we'd have to have like an like a mass abundance of robotics, mm-hmm. like functional robotics. Like yeah. AI can get as wild as it can. It can, I mean, it can nuke us. That's the one thing, right? Yeah. But if it wanted to survive and flourish, and 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 just be like, okay, we are now the owners of this planet. I feel like you would need robotics. They they have to be like mobile in a way, like right to get from one way to another, to be able to repair themselves when they break down over time, et cetera. We're a good workforce for that. Let me throw that out there. Well, you know, before okay, you pull yeah, the trigger, yeah, yeah, hold on. There's AI that overlords, route. You, know, you, could, you might want to keep us around. There is that route. You ever watch yeah. F one? <laughs> Tires are we, changed. We'll get in there real quick. Real quick, <laughs> real quick for you. But yeah, this is a. It's you're right. This is one of those topics that. It feels like it could hit anytime, anywhere, which is, I think, what draws that morbid curiosity. And and also what makes it even more scary is that, and we're going to talk about it, there's a few cases like this that we've already discussed, like poisoning, widespread, things like that, that are completely unsolved. No one to go off of, no suspects, completely cold. I mean, just like the, our, the food that we eat, the things that we drink, they go the through... The air we breathe. Yeah, it, it just... The, so many things out of our hand and like it touches so many different stations hands etc to Mm -hmm. get to us at any point in time it just you know we're down here on the 50th floor of the basement downward and so yeah to get all those supplies down here it's got to go through a lot of trusting hands yeah we have an extra extra right our bunker's got a bunker but you know we still have to trust but before we dive into this subject there are a few sensitive topics i want to mention graphic descriptions murder and suicide in this? In this one. So it's a wide region. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll get into it. It's Damn. a colorful one. Let me take you back, though. It's not all that long ago, but let me take you back. April 30th, 1985, a 45-year-old truck driver stopped for a drink in Fukuyama, Hiroshima. As he approached the vending machine, he noticed a bottle of Aronaman C sitting on top of the vending machine. Presumably not wanting to turn down a free beverage, he decided to grab it, take it, and drink it. Aronaman C is a carbonated drink with added vitamin C. It's quite popular among middle-aged men in Japan, or at least was at the time. Based on online discussion, just to provide that 4DX experience to the task force, 
It sounds like it is a combination of Orangina and Red Bull in flavor, with a slight medicinal taste to it. Oh, okay. Two days later, the truck driver died in the hospital, and Paraquat was found in his vomit. Now, Paraquat is going to be the topic of the day. It's a liquid herbicide usually used for killing weeds. It's extremely toxic, and here in the United States, it's only available to those with a commercial license, and it's also dyed blue in case it ever contaminates anything. You can see that some other foreign object is in the liquid. So you would see if something yeah. is contaminated. It, it is wild because there's just so... As, as as smart and as intelligent humans are, we are so fragile. And there's so many things that exist out in the world naturally, but then also that we've manufactured ourselves mm -hmm. that could kill us. There's so many things that Instantly. are flavorless, tasteless, odorless, yeah. clear. Yeah. It's like, that's water. Go, boop, boop, boop. Exactly. Gone. Almost honestly, to the point where you just go, I don't know, it's too much to worry about. Right. Because just, it could be anything, everything, all the time. Unless we're Tony Stark, we need to stop synthesizing. Yes. Okay. Maybe new atoms. That's kind of cool. I don't know. Just like science. But you know what? We got a lot of chemistry out there. Yeah, we do. Now, in Japan at the time, this paraquat was widely available and it could be purchased by anybody over 18. So we're starting with a big old pool of accessibility here. Nowadays, I'd say that 32 countries have banned the use of paraquat outright due to its high toxicity levels and its tremendous link to cancers. Interestingly enough, Japan is not one of those 32 countries, meaning it is still available to this day. However, they did make it much more difficult to attain. So for example, you need a commercial license and they've also changed the concentrations with which Paraquat is used in herbicides. Obviously learning from the case we're about to discuss. Paraquat poisoning can happen from just touching it and inhaling it. It's that toxic. So we're talking about people consuming it where it would go to the kidneys, go to the liver, and be distributed to the entire body. This so this thing is just deadly any which Ooh, way. Absolutely. That's, Top to bottom. Like you don't even have to be touching it. It could be airborne. Yeah. Oh man. I mean, there are herbicides that strictly interfere with the photosynthetic nature of a plant and just yeah. block it from basically making energy. Mm-hmm. And that feels like one of those targeted toxins that feels, I don't know if that would be necessarily safe to a human just saying it, but like, this seems like a scorched earth kind of policy. Yeah. Anything it touched organic, I, it's gone. I've tried anything and everything to get rid of these weeds, uh -huh. but this is just going to absolutely obliterate. I say every, live with the like, weeds. Like plant life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're anything in, in eyesight of this thing is, is going to take it out. But Ultimately, when it comes to the symptoms, it can cause kidney, heart, respiratory, and liver failure, as well as other symptoms such as seizures, vomiting, and it can even lead to comas. Five months later, on September 11th, a 52-year-old man named Haruo Otsu went to get an Aronomen seat in Izumasano, Osaka, on his way to go fishing. For the record, this is about 174 miles from Fukuyama, or 280 kilometers, so not close. We're already starting with a second case quite far away from the originating case. Unlike the Tegin incident that we talked about recently, that all kind of happened in a cluster, yeah. minus one incident far away. Mm -hmm. He, the second case, Otsu, he received two bottles, and midway through his second bottle, Otsu began to feel sick. Two days later, he died in the hospital, and upon investigation, Paraquat was found in the bottles of soda that he was drinking from. Now, between April 30th and November of 1985, at least 10 people died after ingesting Aronomen C or real gold, a cola that was also laced with Paraquat. So it seems like in this particular case, it was mostly focused on Aronomen C. However, there were a few cases, or at least one case, where real gold, a cola brand, was also poisoned. So, I mean, quite like questions to, that I'll never get answered, or mm -hmm. most likely won't get answered. Why one specific brand of drink that's a very good question and then why the random one that's that's another good point too because, because it seemed like it was very precise yeah. i'm just gonna go after this particular brand of drink yep and then there's the random one but then if you're willing to do a different one then why wouldn't you just do different ones all together yeah right you just go i feel like if there's variety then you would just full send it and go with whatever's convenient mm -hmm. but if you're going for a specific one then why deviate like it's yeah. it's just it's just enough in the gray like it's yeah absolutely i mean it's a very good question i won't attempt to answer it now because while we won't give a clear definitive answer we will kind of dabble with that idea in the theory section as well as drawing some comparisons to other cases that have 
such as the Chicago Tylenol murders, right? Mm. Where one product is targeted, perhaps a demographic is targeted, and we extrapolate ideas from there. Interestingly though, okay, so real gold was also in the mix very lightly, but also in one of these potential 10 cases, Dequat, another herbicide, was found to be the culprit, whereas Paraquat was the main toxin used in, in all these cases. Dequat poisoning is very similar to Paraquat poisoning, but in addition to the same effects I read earlier, it can also have severe neurological side effects. So it's gnarly, even more gnarly, if you can imagine Jeez. that. Now, most of these cases were in the vicinity of Osaka, though some occurred in Tokyo, 352 miles away, or 556 kilometers. Anywhere between Hiroshima and Tokyo were at risk. A 500-mile gap, 800 kilometers. This is a wide range for people to become aware of this and to start fearing either this one product, right? Maybe yeah. they're targeting a brand, or just beverages in general. I don't know which, I feel like a wide swath of beverages would be much more terrifying, but to your question, maybe we're starting to open the door on the idea of, was there something behind this company in particular that yeah, they were trying to attack? Yeah, was it a disgruntled employee? Right. Uh, like a rival company? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Like, it just, it opens up those questions yes. when it's just a bunch of random sodas. It gives you a few routes to chase down, but honestly, much like any of these unsolved mysteries, I feel like it opens more do doors than it closes. Oh. Frustratingly. Every time. But yeah, in the end, at least 35 people were seriously injured from ingesting Paraquat from their drinks, leaving essentially no trace, no witnesses, no anything to really go off of other than the people who went to certain vending machines and where they were and when they passed. I mean, how do you track that down? You see, start with the people, the, the company that supplies the vending machines. Maybe there's some sort of pattern there. Yeah, perhaps. But, but also, it's just like, how do you, I mean, like... I'm very curious to see, because we're getting into the investigation, is how it was delivered into the cans of soda. Yep. I'm thinking like maybe it was like a small little needle and then injected it in. Bingo. Well, not bingo. I, <laughs> I just think your question, though, is my bingo on the uh, the gut instinct. Um, um, my, my brain goes to needle as well, yeah. but they're compressed bottles of soda, so you wouldn't want any leakage. Yeah, that's the thing, too, like how did it leak. But then from there, I guess you're getting into the factory. Mm-hmm. Well, there's there's a curious angle that I didn't really think Ooh. about, so we'll we'll walk you into it. But okay. when it comes to the locations, obviously police are trying to go off of anything, so they're looking at the locations of these vending machines, trying to draw conclusions, and it seems like in pretty much all of these cases, a drink was left on the vending machine or in the slot. Essentially, a free drink was left behind, and these are trusting individuals going, well, I was going to get a drink, and there's one right here. Boom. So most likely, it's... Not someone that works for the vending machine company or is like a vendor delivering. Because mm -hmm. the then it would kind be of in. Because it'd most likely be inside. Yeah. I mean, sure, they could go the extra mile, an extra layer, but then that also kind of steers the eyes in that direction. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to be like a, you'd got to be thinking on a bigger level to be like, okay, hold on now. Like, I put it inside, then mm -hmm. they'll suspect me. Who, yeah, who else could do that? I right? put it outside. Yeah. And yeah. So yeah. most likely it's just someone that's like, doesn't work, has nothing to do with the vending machine, mm -hmm. put it in, and then just saw it. Ooh, free drink. Yeah. Well, I mean, the conclusion that the police kind of came to was whoever this was, was simply buying the product, taking it to wherever they kept their poison, imbuing it with the poison traveling the drinks back to various vending machines and then putting them there. So whether they took it from the original vending machine or somewhere else, it doesn't matter. There's a site A where they bought it, a site B where they poisoned it, and then site C being the vending machine where they left it. That's kind of the theory that the police are going off of, which completely cuts off a lot of opportunity to figure out who and where. It yeah. removes a lot of breadcrumbs. Now, before the murders, Aronim and C had been offering a special two-for-one lucky deal for customers. And because of this, many of the victims had believed perhaps that they had gotten lucky, that they had a two for one. This would explain why, for example, Otsu didn't question why he had a second bottle. Like he went to purchase one, but there was another one already in the slot kind of. And so he was like, cool, I, I guess I have two. Or perhaps why the original person didn't question why there was one on the vending machine because Again, maybe there's this lucky deal. Someone got two. They didn't want it. So pay it forward. Put it on the machine. So 
Oh man, so, I feel like so, that's so devious to be like. Oh, I hope, I hope it's a... not planned using that, but oh, it, but it I, obfuscates some stuff. I, I mean, I feel like it would be. If not, they'd at least realize like, oh, I could take advantage of this. This just so happens to line up really well. Yeah, I think they were they were aware. Jeez. Now, like I said, there were no eyewitnesses, which makes this very complicated. But unlike today, I mean, this is in the '80s, so it's not all that long ago. Nowadays, I see all sorts of CCTV footage. You can't really do anything anywhere right. without someone having a camera there. All of these vending machines were in kind of nooks and crannies behind places, essentially saying no cameras to capture what went down and also away from any potential prying eyes. No one could accidentally witness this thing. So it felt like these vending machines were intentionally chosen. What's, oh, I, I would say so. What's wild is that like nowadays, I mean, sure, there's still a lot of blind spots, but I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, it's like the movies, right? Where they're able to track someone from camera to camera to camera right. as they walk down eight blocks. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? There's just surveillance cameras everywhere. Oh, yeah. Now, the other thing that complicates the case is the fact that symptoms had varying starting times, depending on how much the soda they drank, but essentially people wouldn't pass for around two days is what seems to be the consistent thing. And so because of that, it complicates the point of origin of the soda, when they drank it, where they might have gone, who they might have interacted with. But either way, according to CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, large doses of Paraquat will almost immediately cause pain and swelling in the mouth. And then within the day, you'll experience things like nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. Only in a few days would symptoms eventually turn fatal. So that's where, again, I'm just highlighting in this investigation how all these things line up to, to really fuzzy the trail a little bit. So I want to ask you a question because, of course, I have some of the police's conclusions based on their understanding of the case. But given that this had such a wide range, 500 miles, 800 kilometers spread, what would your inclination be? We, we talked about this very recently in the Tygeen incident where people were like, was this a group of people? Was this an individual? What does your gut instinct say would be most likely with a case like this? I think with this, I think it was an individual. What I gives mean, you, I'm, I'm very curious what gives you that inclination. Because Not I, that I'm saying you're wrong. I, I think to me that it, it's the scale of it. Mm -hmm. Like, I think what's the farthest distance? Maybe like uh, 150 miles, you said, or something like that, from one location to the other. So there were incidents in Tokyo and incidents in Hiroshima. And those would be the furthest apart, about a 500 mile distance. Mm. Majority of the cases were in Osaka. A majority were halfway. in Osaka. It's a good yeah. midway point between Hiroshima and Tokyo. Oh, see? So I it's kind of like, like they did a little hot spot and then went up and down? I feel like, yeah, they, they originated in, um, it was a Hiroshima, uh, where, where was the middle point? Osaka. Osaka, yeah. Yeah, and then went to Tokyo. Hiroshima Jeez. as just they just want to expand yeah but uh, but that's what tells me it's not as widespread and also like the amount is, you said maybe like 10 fatalities as much as 30 yeah. injured yeah 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 35 injured um 10 people passed I mean you're talking soda cans too that's that's quick and well, easy bottles. oh bottles bottles yeah but but you're right I mean yeah quick and easy to lug those around I mean that that's and popping to nearby cities could be a way to be like well no look it's that's, multiple that's, people that's real I mean you can do I mean, you're talking 30 people. You could do that route in a day if you really wanted to. Like, yeah. ma majority, and then drive overnight, go hit up one. And like, you can, you can, if you really want to, cover it in like two to three days. Well, I mean, to boot, these are spread out over from April, the end of April to November. So there's some time. Yeah. I mean, oh, you got okay. plenty of time. Yeah. I just feel like it, it would be on a bigger scale. Yeah. I mean, that's where there is some difference. Police at the time believed that it was one person, and I think there's a lot of reason to believe that. But given the distance, there was a lot of other people out there that were like, well, it feels like it might be multiple people. But frustratingly, as we almost always see at this point with cases like this, there were a couple of copycat crimes that broke out of course. after the news of this initial case kind of made its way across Japan. So we have a very limited profile as far as the culprit, they seem to mostly be targeting aronamin C using a particular poison. They're mostly in Osaka with a few sprinkles elsewhere, I guess, but we, otherwise we don't really have much of a profile. But when it comes to the profile of the victims, almost all of them were middle-aged men, though the final victim of note was a 17-year-old girl. 
Many believe that this may have meant the killer was targeting this particular demographic, that of Oranum and C, and then stopped when the wrong person in their mind was killed. I'm, let's be honest, though. Like, everyone drinks soda. You have kids drink that drink That's soda. True. How, like... Kids aren't drinking... Well, hold on. High C. Right. I was going to say, that was that high in... Can you look that up, Christian? Was that high in vitamin C? Or was that <laughs> or just was a just lie? The marketing? <laughs> was that just a weird name? But yeah. But, I mean, but everyone... Yeah, you're right. Oh, no. Everyone of all everyone ages... Everyone likes a little soda. Everyone of all ages drinks soda. Was it high in vitamin C? Uh, it apparently contained about 56% more vitamin C than Coca-Cola. That is a terrible baseline. That's okay. what he gave me. <laughs> right. And this protein Coca-Cola shake gives me one percent. <laughs> and this one gives me fifty six percent. I'm God. still. You wanted a quick answer. I gave you a quick answer. Hey, two hundred percent short on my dailies. <laughs> if you compare all your food to Coca Cola, I feel like you're eating salad for every meal. <laughs> um, I mean, but you're right. You're right. Just how? How but, did not hit like someone younger? Well, that's the thing is, it seems like the demographic when it just came to the people that happened to drink a random and see, it happened to be middle aged and older men. That just seemed to be the demographic for it. And so now that starts yeah, to like prune juice or something like like. Well, I mean, or yeah, that's the I extreme, see. right? Like getting up there. But I mean, like I don't know, some kind of non. I, I don't. Man. Well, it comes back to your original question. Why Aronim and C? Is it because it has a shared demographic with what the poisoner is after? Or are they after the company itself and it just happened to have a very tight demographic? So, who knows? Yeah. And it's interesting that, like, so there was a 17-year-old girl yes. that got sick mm -hmm. and then passed away. Mm -hmm. And then I'm assuming from there it stopped? That's when it seems it stopped, yes. Wow. Some people speculate that the killer may have wanted the, quote, salary men demographic that Aronim and C had, and so that's why they were after it, and that they stopped poisoning these sodas after the young girl passed away. There's no evidence for this, but it is suspicious that as soon as the, air quotes, potential wrong victim, again, we're all theorizing, but as soon as somebody different passed away, that it just ended. We'll never know because this was one of those poisoners that didn't write letters or... You know, didn't do the Zodiac thing where they proclaim themselves or didn't do the 21 I monster mean, with 21 faces thing. You know? Unfortunately for us, that there was like the world just used because I can't find my own around. They were smart, right? Because you have other other killers and terrible people who want the fame and the glory. They want the theatrics and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And and that as terrible as it is, that at least gives us something to try and chase down. Mm hmm. Right? Like, th that's what I think about, like, all the time. Like, if you take, like, a 50, like, like a just a 50 cal sniper rifle into the woods and you just shoot it into a town, how are you ever going to get caught if you just pick up and leave? I don't know, man, but I've seen Legolas track down a horde of orcs and I feel like you get a, you get a ranger, taste the ground, put their ear to the ground, they might find you. I don't know how that stuff works, but really, though, I get what you're saying. Is it traceable? I don't know. What scares me even more is that if this person, to your earlier point, went total random on the sodas, total random on the victims, that would just be total pandemonium. Absolute fear. How do you target that source then? There's nothing to even, like, start to trace. I mean, this makes me think now, when you include um, the young girl, that... This this leads my mind to think that they were specifically targeting that drink because of their demographic then. Right? Yeah. Like, could be not like just that to me gives reason to why it wasn't just like a random assortment mm -hmm. of, of drinks. I mean it's it's very similar to what we talked about in the Monster with 21 Faces, which if you don't remember that episode, we're gonna talk about it a little bit more in the theories, because there's a lot of similarities and the timeline is very close in time to this one, if, if not concurrent, actually. Well, hello there, Task Force. It's that moment in the episode where we peel back the moist curtains. We have really drippy curtains like here, a boys. Lemon. Like a lemon? Yeah, peel it like a lemon. It smells like a lemon. Yeah. We peel these Ooh. curtains back to uh, give you a little breath of fresh air, lemony, citrusy air. There we go. Uh, give you a, a break in the mystery if, in case you were getting fearful of what was going on, the unknown. To talk to you directly about what's going on in Red Web and uh, and whatnot. This is we are fresh off the heels of RTX. You guys came and conquered the escape room. You came 
and uh, joined the cult of Squonk at the <laughs> annual meeting of the minds. <laughs> Fredo, give him a little hint of the madness that went down. Oh, uh, you know, Jeopardy. It made no sense, <laughs> but the most sense to me. I buckled in, kept my hands and feet inside the ride, and I had a good time. It was a uh, non sequitur after non sequitur, and uh, it was a good time. It was I'm really still trying to ribbon. process it. I well, still know. I think we'll be processing it until the next annual meeting of the month. That's very true. Yeah, it's just enough time. <laughs> Which I'll have possibly <laughs> another game no show. New things. <laughs> but Task Force, it was so good to see you all in person coming down. Thank you so much for coming to RTX here in Austin. I know travel is a whole chore and a half. So for you guys to come down and hang out with us, it was an absolute treat. Very much looking forward to doing other. Red Web live things in the future, seeing you all in person. But as always, I just also want to give a shout out to everybody who's been giving uh, feedback and five-star reviews on Spotify, Google Play, and on Apple Podcasts, and all the other various places you can listen to us on, like the Rooster Teeth app, uh, and, and on YouTube, where mm -hmm. you can give a thumbs up. SoundCloud. SoundCloud. Mm -hmm. Wait, hold on a second. <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah, thank you, Task Force, for so, so much for just showing up and always supporting the show really means a lot to us. And, uh, and another show I want to shout out that you can give that sweet, sweet love to is 30 Morbid Minutes. It's essentially our sister podcast. You have Elise Willems and Jessica Fasami always talking about, in 30 minutes or less, the morbid histories behind topics you've heard about before. I mean, we have some things that we've covered that they've covered, like human combustion, but they always have a really cool angle that they come at, and they always complement the things that you might already know about the topic. They get into like the macabre details of Victorian England and everything. And I'll just tease you with a little subtlety like that. But you should get in there, support their show. You get, they're wherever you want to listen to us. So if you're listening to us mm -hmm. now, they're right next door. Go pop over, give them a little oh, sub. Tons of stuff to listen to. Absolutely. But otherwise, I have a fantastic sponsor I want to talk about today. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by The Farmer's Dog. To keep your dog happy, Fredo, and healthy, look no further than The Farmer's Dog. Why the farmer's dog, Christian, you may ask? I did. I yeah. Did well, they make and deliver fresh, vet-recommended dog food made from human-grade ingredients in safe, clean kitchens. Unlike traditional options, their food is minimally processed, and they provide pre-proportioned meals tailored to your dog's nutritional needs. It helps maintain their ideal weight, leading to healthy, full, happy lives which I really appreciate. You know, you got to look after yourself as humans eating well, but mm -hmm. your little buddies, they got to eat well too. I'm telling you, these dogs will be eating better than us. They're going to be eating better than <laughs> us. Mm -hmm. Get your dog a custom diet plan. I don't have a custom <laughs> diet plan. I don't have one either. <laughs> fresh ingredients? I'm not eating fresh ingredients. <laughs> We actually have another coworker here in this office building, the Task Force HQ, who has a dog, and their dog is obsessed with the farmer's dog branded food. They love how it tastes, and they just want to suckle it down every single time they fill that bowl. They hear the cling clang of the, the metal bowl getting filled up with the farmer's dog brand food, and then they run, drooling, salivating all over. I did too. I also came running at the bowl, and they had to hold <laughs> me back. Um, but they said it came with three different flavors, and their dog loved every single one. And I, that's something that, as a, a long-standing dog owner, or I grew up with dogs, I should say. I don't have a dog now. But growing up with dogs, I always thought, why do dogs always have just the same flavor? So I appreciate that they send out a multitude of flavors to keep the variety alive for your dog. You like different flavors as a human being, Fredo. Your dog's going to like different flavors, too. Oh, no, I just really like french fries, though. <laughs> mm. They do like the table oh. food. But when it comes to our coworker, they said their dog ate the bowl of food and then went and waited by the fridge for the next meal. They saw that the bag came from the fridge, and as soon as they finished it, they ran right back to the food in the fridge, waiting for another bowl. 10 out of 10, they would recommend again, and uh, I gotta love it. I love hearing about just pups in general. Yeah, I am. Um, eating good. Uh, I have uh, two corgis, and so I was looking into, um, you know, I was looking into the food as well, and they're highly reviewed mm -hmm. online. Like, they're, they're praised for their like the quality of food which absolutely is, which is awesome and then i was looking at the little like like how they set up the test and everything like that and they ask you questions of like it's very personalized like what is his or her name so i was like Liam, i love that Gavu. it was like how's the activity and it's just like what size is your dog uh -huh. <laughs> like and it's so very it's, it's, personalized. it's very personalized it's like I'm a canine like, nutritionist yeah That's and it great. shows you like you know the bag with their name on it and mm -hmm. it's like custom made for they I'm can't like, read, but I appreciate it. Right. right. I can, though. That's so I go, cool. I go, that's for me. The little tag, <laughs> right. print out and put it on the food. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, 
As a human, you want your meals personalized, you want to have your nutrition sought after, and you also want a variety of, of fresh ingredients with different flavors. Yeah. Why not your pup too? Yep. You treat them like your family, feed them like your family, uh, and that's where the farmer's dog can come in, help keep your dog happy, healthy for all your adventures together with the farmer's dog. Get 50% off your first box at thefarmersdog.com slash redweb. Once again, that's thefarmersdog.com slash redweb for 50% off your first box. Thefarmersdog.com slash redweb. With that said, let's get right back into the mystery. But yeah, let's talk more about the investigation before we get there, though. The Japan Soft Drink Bottlers Association told the public that they should be more cautious, and if victims had paid more attention to their bottles they would have noticed that they were tampered with. To further warn customers, they had issued a total of 1.3 million stickers with warnings that went on their bottles to say, hey, make sure that this bottle hasn't been tampered with, and those stickers ran through the end of this particular crime spree. According to the New York Times, some in the vending machine industry believed that there was no killer, that potentially the victims had chosen to end their own lives. It's worth noting that Paraquat was a common method for suicide in 1984, and it turns out it was used in over 1,400 suicide attempts in Japan alone. Now, this could be damage control by the vending machine industry, by the bottling industry, or it could just be people pointing fingers all sorts of ways. But what's really important to note is that bottles were different at that time. Because despite what the Bottlers Association said about tampered drinks being obvious, etc., etc., Historian Koichiro Hamada claimed the bottle industry was still transitioning to the tamper-proof lids. That is to say, in the late 70s, there was a pull cap that was being introduced to these bottle tops, so that way you could tell when a, when a bottle had been opened. However, this had not been widely communicated to consumers, nor was it universal all at once. It was kind of one of those things that trickled Slowly to Slowly rolled it out. Yeah. And so then, while I'm there is... I'm assuming they just used the ones that you can tell we're tampered with. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it leaves that window of time open to people just not knowing to see if it's been tampered with or, yeah, just tamperable bottles. I think going back to, like, the, the suicide theory, I feel like that's just either the corporations trying to save face or it's people just wanting to continue the attention of the story for their own benefit and we talk about it all the time where it's like well okay this has been talked about from every which angle analyzed every which way like what's a different spin that i could like drum up and so people like to get people talking about that angle and coming to me to have these discussions or coming to my place to have these discussions and i feel like that's what it is it's just it's like a New York Times little, trying to sell papers kind of thing? Or? either Yeah, people are trying to sell papers because they want to have, you know, a new narrative to, to garner more attention. Or it's the company saving face. I, it I could think, be a lot of corporate saving face. Yeah. Like, oh no, soda consumption's down. Right. Hey, there's nothing to worry about. But, but like, it, it, like, the thing to me is just... You're, so you're telling me, what, roughly like 29 men around the span of six seven months all had the same idea in a, in a, in a like somewhat yeah and then what about area. the 17 year old and then you know? right then you have the random 17 year old girl like it's just it's, it's yeah you're right it's it, it's, it's the demographic being so similar and right. the the vessel the soda well, being a cult the same. at that point <laughs> yeah it, honestly <laughs> my mind starts to go okay well are these copycat suicide cases or are these all Which even then, like, like 30, like 29, 30 people. Yeah. And, and yeah. one, why the elaborate story of I found the drink on the vending machine, etc. Two, I'm we've heard a couple cases, but I'm sure a handful, if not all, went to the hospital. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. It, 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 it's definitely a muddy arena, and it and any further conversation would be riddled with assumptions, but I feel what you're yeah, saying. Like, yeah. it could easily be corporations trying to save face. It could easily be, you know, all sorts of stuff. But, but either way, I want to talk a little bit more about these tamper-proof bottles. The advent of the pull tab, the pull cap, as it's called, was actually caused from an early 1977, like, situation that was very similar to this case. In January 1977, there was a string of similar drink poisonings that occurred after a high school student picked up an unopened bottle of Coca-Cola at a payphone in Minato, central Tokyo. 
Soda contained cyanide, and after drinking it the next day, the student passed away. Three to seven, it, there's wide ranges depending on the resources you look at, but somewhere between three and seven other individuals were also poisoned with cyanide in the same manner through February of 1977. And this was the case that really pushed the bottling industry to say, okay, we need a way to prove these things have or have not been tampered with. Yeah. It's just that that information didn't roll out unanimously or transparently enough for consumers. Well, here, I have, I have a photo of what the that poll tab would look like. And so you can tell if that tab had been pulled. It's like a ring next to the cap. Oh, yeah. And if it was gone, you'd be like, oh, tampered. But if you didn't know, and the so cap it was had like, been hammered um, back on. So it's like know. a glass bottle. Mm -hmm. And is it like a foil cap? It looks like it's just a normal metal cap. So instead of a bottle opener going pop, yeah. You would just pull this tab and it would provide you with that upward force. Interesting. I'm curious to see how they got into the, I guess, like, popped it open with a bottle opener and clamped it back down, like... Yeah, using, like, a, a one of those bottling crimper things. Yeah. I don't know. Christian, do we know if the Aronim and C had the tamper-proof lid at that time yet or not? Because, I mean, clearly the company is trying to say, you can no. tell. At the time, the, the pull cap was not present on the Aronim and C. That's got what the it. picture on the left is. That's a picture oh, of an ad showing what the bottle it. looked like at the time these okay. crimes occurred. Yeah. And yeah, the right is what it looked like after, after. we got the pull cap. Gotcha. So no, we don't know. I mean, how do they get it in? Then? Yeah, that we don't know. I don't know if it was a bottle opener situation or if it was kind of a twist cap. Mm -hmm. Those twist know. caps can, like, yeah, can go if it's right a, back on. If it was a bottle opener situation, you pretty much dent the like top of the bottle cap when you pull it open like that yep so that would be pretty apparent and then if it was a twist cap then yeah you could twist it off and then try and twist it back on if it was like a foil type situation then yeah i guess you could lift it squirt it in and then like seal it back with a little bit of glue yeah mike now i'm just my mind is wandering because i don't know exactly what this cap i mean i can see it in the ad but it looks like a white cap. I don't know if it's got the logo on it or anything, but maybe it was just replaced with a nondescript blank white cap. And so it looked close True. enough. Like, if you went and got a Sprite bottle, you know it's green. It says some stuff on it and usually has a code underneath it now, but right. and if you were none the wiser, you'd be like, green looks right. There's so many seasonal different looks and flavors, etc. I'd yeah. be like, oh, I guess they're just the new thing is the white cap. You know right. what I mean? Like, yeah, I don't know. But either way... With no evidence and no suspects, the case went cold. That leads us to our two big old theories. That doesn't surprise me. How do you, how, how do you mm -hmm. track this down? This is the type of case and situation where you just pray something lands in your lap because otherwise there's nothing else you can do. Absolutely. Nothing else you can do. You have to, yeah, pray for a witness, pray for a camera to have glimpsed something. Mm hmm but whoever it was seemed to target those vending machines that were tucked away. Let's talk now about the theories. I did tease this one in the midst of the episode, so I'm very eager to talk about it. So at the same time as these vending machine murders, there was another case involving poisoned food that was going on. The monster with the 21 faces. We did an entire episode on this task force. If you want to go get into that in the depths, all the theories, all the details and everything, go check that out. But just in case, I'll give you the brief synopsis. On March 18th, 1984, a group that called themselves the Monster with 21 Faces kidnapped the president of Azaki Glico, who makes the snack Pocky. Very fantastic stuff. Tasty. Love that snack. After three days, the president broke free from his captors. The monster began sending threatening letters to the police about Azaki Glico, and on May 10th, told the company it had laced $21 million worth of Pocky with potassium cyanide. They changed their focus to Morinaga, another snack company, and began poisoning their products. The letters did not cease until August 12, 1985, when the monster wrote that they would stop. This would be in the midst of the vending machine murders, now 1985. So since these crimes occurred at the same time and both involved poisoning specific food items, some believe that these crimes could have been related, whether it be a copycat or perhaps was this the monster with 21 faces with a different mission, or whatever their, if you want to call it a mission, what it's got their MO written all over it. The only thing that it doesn't have is their consistent letter writing. The vending machine murders were completely silent. I would think, why would they change it up? This would either be the cop, a copycat or someone that was just heavily inspired by. Could be. You know? Yeah. I feel like 
they were going after these big i don't know the like 21 faces that whole episode to me just seemed like it was a person or a group with a mission yep to they're just like not only am i targeting these companies there's a reason why i have a philosophy i have a belief etc this case just seems like it's just someone that's wanting to just torch the the planet you yeah. know there's no rhyme or reason they're just they just want to do bad and they know they can get away with it yeah i mean in that sense it does feel like it could be a copycat i mean on one hand yes they they too the vending machine murders did target one specific brand however in one or two cases they used a different poison they targeted a different product real gold so there are a few incongruities if that's a, the right word there's a few differences between the cases the main one being that they didn't proclaim themselves antagonize police and say this is why we're doing it this is why we're attacking this particular story. yeah i think it would be a little more gray to me if this happened before mm -hmm. um the 21 faces incident or post like right in the midst i feel like they i don't know i feel like the the 21 face group or person individuals etc they i they, they i feel like they found their stride they knew what they were doing right they had yeah. a mission we're gonna target this company we have this plan like they're focused on that thing yeah and then, not getting caught yeah, right and then switching over to a different company in the midst to do the random bottle stuff like and, and then also switch up a lot of the mo it doesn't make sense to me yeah what's interesting is the fact that there were definite copycats that came from this vending machine spree here seems to indicate to me that perhaps we have a domino effect perhaps monster with 21 faces did something unprecedented and people started to do it in their own way and then people copied that and copied that and then poisoning kind of as a motif for crime just started to spread some theorize you know if okay if it's not monster with 21 faces i.e they have a similar mo but it isn't the same maybe the reason they targeted aronaman c was because they as a company portrayed their drink as a health drink despite its high concentration of sugar and so, again, this is just trying to extrapolate, uh, theoretically, why this person or these people would be doing this. Yeah, I don't think it'd be the same group because there's no letter. That's, I think, they're, that's the they, biggest difference, the, like for sure. They were big on making a statement. Like I said, it felt like it a group or people with, like, a, a solid belief in what they were doing. Yeah. They so, were like, we're targeting this product yeah. across all of these stores with a lot of detail. So why not? And this why. They're like, yeah. why drop that for the soda company? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. now, Unless to just spread fear, you know? But I, I tend it to... It just doesn't seem like it's their... It doesn't seem like... Yeah, yeah, like, it seems like it's more like, again, they were targeting the company specifically. Yeah. Fear was just something that came with. This is... this crime is like hurting individuals yeah. hurting people with no rhyme or reason whereas the monster 21 I, faces while hurting people was also also trying to hurt a corporate entity yes which yeah. i feel like that's the main goal yeah here the main goal seems to be to hurt people yeah now they're targeting the i mean i could see because originality either like even today but even back then is hard to come by everyone's always inspired by someone or something and so I feel like this is a person that was inspired by, you know, the monster 21 faces. And so from there, they're like, well, that could be the reason mm. is what you're describing to me yeah, as to why. So now when I go, this is just random and chaos. This makes me think there could be this. This could be an actual reason why, because like, hey, we have healthy drinks. And then don't talk about the sugar Don't talk about the sugar. Right. Um, but they weren't 21 faces, which is why they didn't have this grandiose like s stage that they want to perform on it was more so let me just target this company yeah and and hopefully something happens that yeah. like benefits what i believe that they're doing wrong it seems like a sinister individual i agree with you inspired by someone or some group bigger than them again evil as they are but they they themselves are like i'm kind of a novice i'm kind of a copycat and if I write a letter, I'm done. I'm not right. that. So I, I tend to agree with you. And I think also that is the kind of popular disposition. It's a theory, but I do think that that's the disposition is that a lot of people believe that they were maybe inspired by the monster's methods or simply chose this time to do it while the police were preoccupied by such a public case. With that said, comes the next theory. It's one of those kind of more subject-centric theories as opposed to is it that person or that group with that reason 
Because with no evidence to go off of, the theory came through that perhaps this was the result of a yukai han, which roughly translates to a crime committed for fun. In 1985, Professor Susumu Oda of Tsukuba University told New York Times of an emerging type of killer called yukai han. Quote, they cynically enjoy superiority by imagining the victims groaning and do not feel any remorse. They likely enjoyed imagining the horrible side effects their victims faced. In other cases like this, they're called thrill kills. Jack Levin of Northeastern University and the director of Brudnick Center on Conflict and Violence told ABC News, quote, maybe they feel like they've fallen short of their goal. They don't feel like they're in control and they erupt in a way that is kind of a sadistic thrill. The frightening thing is that some of them never talk about it. They never let you know it's coming. To a certain extent, they may make their victims suffer so they can feel good. Going back to the cases at the beginning of 1977, these could be other examples of Yukai Han, assuming that they aren't the same person as the vending machine murders. Basically, that is to say, maybe the reason why they have kind of an MO, but don't, and it feels a little sporadic, but also inspired and kind of whatever, could simply be a sadistic person. Yeah. You know, and like, yes, that doesn't answer who it is, doesn't really give any sort of comfort, but it does kind of diagnose why this case came about. Yeah, not everyone wants the attention. Some people just want to know that they're able to hurt people. Yeah. Though they didn't use the word Yukai Han, psychiatrists said that the copycats of the Chicago Tylenol murders that I mentioned earlier were, quote, emotionally immature people who find excuse to vent their latent hostile emotions when a, quote, leader, like the Tylenol killer, shows them the way. That is to say, somebody of this disposition, this sadistic nature, might essentially unlock this desire to hurt others when they see somebody else. So in this case, this kind of, as I like to do, kind of merge the theories a little bit and pull from each and say, maybe this was a Yukai Han, an individual that was unwell and wanted to hurt others. And because they saw the monster of 21 faces, they thought maybe that's how I do it. That seems good to me. And then the rest is history. Yeah. Uh, we did a whole episode on the Chicago Tylenol murders. If you're interested, that happened in the U.S. in 1982. Man, that was a scary little time window. I mean, 82, and then 84, and then 85. Obviously, two different countries, but like... But still... You can now maybe... I mean, it's easy to be cynical about companies and corporations and trying to like point the other finger or whatever, but there is kind of something to be said about a three-year span of a lot of products being poisoned and trying to like calm people down because you're right to, to your very original point the very top of this episode this kind of crime is if you will so accessible could happen anytime anywhere yeah. it's deeply unsettling and when it's going on like this you kind of need to like and you can't figure it out what do you tell people I, panic right. yeah, yeah. It, it's hard to get people not to panic there's nothing you can do it's so hopeless that like it's not like other mysteries right where we've had like the city or um the people are like just jamming their emotions down the authorities throat to find answers like there needs to be answers and a lot of times too it gets pushed to the point where people get innocent people get put in the crossfire mm -hmm. and are accused or sentenced for things they didn't do yeah here i don't think anyone was i mean to i don't like at least in the right mind to sit here and go how have you not fi like figure this out yet how do you figure this out right, right. i think everyone just goes Please just let's just hope they stop <laughs> because right. like there's nothing you can really do. They yeah. didn't want the theatrics. They just want to hurt people, and they did it in a way that's just near impossible to trace. Yeah, I mean we've done years now of weekly topics, mysteries, unsolved cases, true crime. Of course, we dabble all over the place, but like when it comes to the true crime stuff, this might be one of the most unsolved, if you can even say that where there's so little to go off of, even the theories are just pointing to, okay, well, can we understand the mind of the person behind this? Just to start with, let alone who is it for these reasons? Because like even Zodiac Killer, we had like three different people to discuss in depth. Even Jack the Ripper, we had people in particular to dissect. Mm -hmm. This is, yeah, it's just pure fear. And you, nothing to go off of. You told me the, the hook in the beginning and immediately i just went i i'd be surprised if there were suspects you know what i mean yeah like yeah. i'm not expecting that here um and then the theories like i'm not expecting that like there were you know i don't know it's just one of those things where i was just like ah, it's just even before 
like knowing like, oh, maybe someone could have came forward. It just seemed like such a simple thing that you, I don't know, just something about like soda can or soda bottles being tampered with. I was immediately just like, this seems like a just like touch and go situation. And I'm like, oh man, we're not going to get anything in the side of like, yeah. like chasing down a path of that, that could lead to someone that eventually like washes away and that becomes a mystery. I was right. like, nah, we're not going to. I was like, man, can we get a glimpse of a man in pink shoes or something? Like anything. And then you see like at the end of the story, the pink shoes hanging from a wire and you're like, man, could have been anybody. Way. Yeah. I remember people just tying their shoes, throwing it up. Yeah. All right. Well, that has been the vending machine murders. Probably, I mean, we've we've like I said, covered a lot of unsettling mysteries, but this might be one of the ones that is just up there in fear factor and just unsettling nature. Will probably remain unsolved in perpetuity. Literally nothing to go off of. But with that said, Fredo, I'll see you back here next week for another mystery, perhaps a little bit more lighthearted. We'll find out. Yeah.